Dave Mustaine, great to have you playing here in Glasgow again. You're co-headlining in the Priest Feast Tour. How's the tour been going so far? Well, <laughs> we're, we're not co-headlining it. Um, I, I think that's kind of how it is, but you know, I think that's how the fans are perceiving it too. But it's Judas Priest's tour, and, and we're special guests on it. I like the sound of co-headlining it. In fact, I like the sound of headlining from the middle. <laughs> so how's the gigs been so far? They've been really good. Uh, we started off in Ireland and did a show in the UK, um, in, in England on the way up here to Scotland, and so we, we've touched uh, almost all of the countries of uh, the UK. And, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think that we're going to uh, make it into anywhere in, in Wales. But um, we've done a pretty good run so far. It's always great doing uh, tours when you're with a local band, choose Priest being English. Uh, they've got a uh, much more extensive tour here in, in the country and it's just good for us because it continues to help us you know, go into new marketplaces. We've never played Sheffield before. Obviously Priest being one of the most influential rock bands, it must all be good to actually see them playing live again. You know, somebody like yourself has obviously been listening to them since a very young age. You know? mm -hmm. Is that the case? Is they still get by seeing them and hearing them play? Me? Yeah. Um, We've already toured with them once before. We did it on the Painkiller tour, and it was actually the same exact lineup: Testament, Megadeth, and Judas Priest. And and I've played with uh, Judas Priest down in Rock and Rio in Brazil. Uh, also, we did uh, uh, dates with them in, in South Central America in uh, Mexico. And, but that was when they had the other singer, uh, Tim, the Ripper Owens, or yeah. whatever his name is, and. Um, you know, for me, uh, Judas Priest is one of those bands that I listened to. I first discovered them when I was 15, and I was so impressed with them that I thought that I wanted to go out and buy a, a fedora because Glenn Tipton was wearing one. You know, consequently, it didn't look as cool on me as it did on him, but, you know, that's, that's okay. We're early 2009, there's a new Megadeth album in the pipeline. How's that been progressing? It's pretty good. Do you want to listen to it? I'd love to listen to Sorry, it. Sorry, we can't do that. <laughs> what kind of songs have we got for it? What kind of themes are we taking into the album? What's Well, obviously we've got a new guitar player, with Chris Broderick, in the band, but the songs are already written before he'd even been discussed. And a lot of the stuff um, we assembled, uh, once he became a band member, we started doing stuff out on the road. And, and uh, when we got into the studio, uh, obviously the finished product now, all the rhythm is done, and the songs are pretty much uh, set in, in their foundation. Uh, how's it going? It's going pretty well. We, we <clears throat> unfortunately, due to uh, problems with our um, <clears throat> the, the powers that be in, in uh, America that we're dealing, uh, that we work with, um, they uh, messed up uh, Andy Sneap's visa, so we got pushed back a little bit. And uh, the problem is, is that even if it's one day, if you miss it by one day, you've got to wait an entire month or ever, however long that is until somebody's schedule frees up again and, you know, the plans line again. So, uh, fortunately enough for us, Andy is a decent enough guy that he's uh, meeting me tomorrow in Manchester and we're going to do some stuff in our hotel room to continue working on the record so that we can get, get it ready for the public. It's supposed to be being released in September. Um, I think it's uh, a very exciting record right now for me. The bandmates that I'm playing with, you know, Sean's been a fan forever, and James has been with me now for several years, and um, Chris is a guitar virtuoso. So when they say that they're they're excited about it, it it's, it's really saying something. Instead of me saying, "Oh man, this is great, man, come check this out, man, it's the greatest stuff <laughs> in the world," you know, and somebody else saying, "Hey, man, come check this out, this is the greatest stuff in the world." What's it like been working with Chris in the studio for this new album? Obviously, a new guy in the band, you know. How's that been? Has it made... Well, Chris is a, uh, you know, uh, if you didn't know that he was just kind of a big, dumb, laughable kid, you would think that um, he is... Uh, um, very intimidating person. Uh, of course, his uh, his playing is very intimidating, and and his appearance could be intimidating to some people. And you put those two together, and it's uh, you know it's a weapon for you know a very uh, successful type of a guitarist. However, um, we weren't really looking for someone that that you know was a mean big bodybuilding guitar virtuoso. You know, we were looking for somebody who was going to be a Megadeth guitar player. And uh, Chris fit that mold perfectly. His playing ability is uh, exceptional. Um, you know, he did have to go through Rock School 101, like everybody that's ever played with me, to learn my style. Not to learn how to play, but just to learn my style. And I, I'm really uh, su surprised with how well he's adapted to everything. And, and he's brought a great air of excitement to the band. Now, here, here's why. Glenn 
Drover was influenced by Chris Pollan. Chris was in the band for only a couple records. Gone. Chris is influenced by Marty Friedman, who was in the band for over 10 years. So, it stands to reason there's more music that Chris has been influenced by, so he's more of a Megadeth guitar player yeah. than somebody who was influenced by a guitar player that wasn't in the band quite as long. Not saying, or taking anything away from Glenn. But, I told Chris when he first started playing with us, I said, I bet you never thought all those hours masturbating to Marty Friedman solos would pay off, would you? So, and here he is now. I mean, it sounds, uh, if, if you didn't know any better, you wouldn't know that it, it was a different guy. Have we got a title for the album yet? Has that been finalized uh, Yeah, it's studio release number 12. <laughs> <laughs> because we don't have a title yet. You know, you always think of all of these things and you think, well, I want to have a really great title and stuff like that. I'm known for having poignant titles that, you know, they are sometimes uh, something that's a little cheeky. Sometimes it's very, you know, um, critical, yeah, but um, we're not there yet. As the songs develop themselves, the title track starts to stand out out of the project, and when the title track starts to stand out, uh, ultimately the record, usually named after the title track, that's why it's called a title track. So uh, the reason I say that is like uh, Cryptic Writings was a song from Use the Man. It, yeah. it had nothing to do, there's no song on that record at all that says Use the Man. But Use the Man started to emerge as what was going to be our most successful uh, radio song because it was going to cross over with other styles, alternative and rock and metal. Trust was the number one track in America. We knew that was going to be a monster. But uh, having said that, you know, you, sometimes you have a song that the name of it doesn't really correlate with the song. So any song titles yet? Yes, yes, we've got a lot of song titles. I can tell you uh, if I go look for them. Um, uh, one of them is called 1320. That's the one that I'm absolutely positive. Uh, that's the one of the songs that we're going to probably be s submitting to the record company first. It's a uh, song about drag racing. And uh, a quarter mile track in America mm -hmm. is 1,320 feet long. So on our website right now, everybody's going like, what the hell is 1,320? And it's not Oprah's waiter, you know, like <laughs> Jenna Jackson's wardrobe malfunction changes numbers or anything like that. It's, it's, it's just a measure of distance from the start line to the finish line. I think adrenaline sports are fantastic. You know, me watching golf, you know, watching a baseball game, that's like watching old people have sex. It's absolutely boring. You know, not that I've ever done that, but uh, <laughs> watching baseball games and playing golf, you know, it's, you, you got to be in the moment. I like adrenaline. I, I used to skydive all the time. I was in martial arts since I was 12. And there is just something about adrenaline that makes m me excited. I went to a drag racing uh, event one time, and they had these nitro funny cars there, yeah. and I was hooked. And consequently, we had a record cover that was done by Sanctuary when we were Sanctuary uh, for the single motorcycle, and I'm inside of a jet funny car. And we came over here to England and went to one of the racetracks here, and they had this famous car there that had the jet engine on Santa it. Santa Pod would have been probably. Who the hell knows? <laughs> I just know that I was there, and it's like, whoa, whoa, and all this stuff coming flying out of the back of the motor, and, and just a big jet engine, and you, you know, I mean, I, I try to impersonate the or do an impression of the sound on it, but you know what? You can just have a sound effect right now. <laughs> it would be like, yeah. <laughs> so playing live just now. Are we hearing any of the new songs at all? Uh, no, not yet. Absolutely not. It's too late. That's coming up soon. <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't have enough uh, of the material being finished yet. It's just it's not not done. It's, uh, you know, I mean, there's not even lyrics to uh, 1320 has lyrics on it, but the rest of the songs haven't been sang yet. Okay, so once the album's out, then we will maybe start hearing some of the new material and seeing mm -hmm. the band too. Every time you pull your hand out, I'm like, like, like ah! talk. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> so once the album's out of the way, we'll maybe then see you band touring again with some of the new material. Well, we uh, this is actually the beginning of our what was to be our world tour, and we were planning on going out for 18 months so or more depending on you know the success of the record the last record we had a tour of, it was uh, around 18 months and we still could have kept going but it was time to go home you know we had a new guitar player that came in in the middle of the tour so we felt the best thing for us to do was stop things come together as a group let the chemistry of Chris uh, permeate the band and see what happens and come out with this next Megadeth uh, chapter in terms of stuff that's forthcoming we've got Gigantour coming up over the summer any Clues as to what's happening there at all? Well, it depends on what Gigantor you're talking about because Gigantor has become a worldwide thing now. Right. We did it in Australia, we did it in uh, the United Kingdom. Well, not so much the UK, it was just in, in, in Great Britain, I think. And then um, we've done it in the States, we've done it in Canada. 
Uh, during the summer so far, the only one that we're really looking at so far is Canada. We're still hoping to get the record far enough along so that when we drop it that we can come over here and do festivals and do a tour here during the summer. But um, if, if it doesn't work out that way, what we're going to do is go home, do the Canadian run, and then uh, come back here unless we go to the Pacific Rim. See, that's the beauty of having all of these territories. You know, it's kind of like we have a world map <laughs> at our house and we just throw darts where we want to go. It's like we're playing there next. <laughs> yeah. That sounds really good. Dave, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking you to you. You sure? I'm going to show you. Okay. Now pleasure it's for real.